on that front, but hey, no one will notice. Right, so <laughs> Zach and myself are going to be talking about PID controllers and why they're really useful for robotics. Um, this cropped up a while back when we were playing with various bits and bobs. I think it's a good time on the next slide, actually. Yes! Um, so we start off with, with why. If you've done things like turtle graphics, you know, it's all if I'm here, right, and you go like 10 steps forward and then left 90 and all the rest of it, this works fine for turtle graphics. But if you're talking with, with real life robots, the wheels slip a bit. DC motors are never, ever, 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 ever paired. So if you get one of the robots that's outside there with the wheels on it, tell it to go straight ahead, it will do a circle. We just argue over what the radius is. And that's why you need the feedback. Because if I'm actually walking around the desk here, you can sit there and go like, yeah, I can keep my hand on the one side, and that's keeping me going, whoop, in roughly a straight line, and I know where the, where the end is. That's the key thing about feedback. It's a good thing because it allows us to correct the errors. Errors don't crop up on things like the total graphics because there is no error in the system. In the real world, you get a lot of errors, and this allows us, oh, straight, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is the errors that occur in the real world you need to correct for. So next bit. Aha. All right, so um, recently I started making a self-balancing robot with my Raspberry Pi. So the plan was that I was going to make a robot that would stand up vertically on two wheels and it would use a gyroscope to measure the angle that it's at to stop it from falling over. So um, firstly I, I programmed it so that if the sensor was falling in one direction it would turn the motors in that direction on full power to correct that. But what we found is that it would often overcorrect it and cause it to fall in the other direction until it would oscillate and fall over. Jim found that very funny. I didn't. Um, actually, so I'm going to be really rude and interrupt at this point. This, I, mean, I had a very, very good guess that this is what, what, what would happen. This is classic control theory, but to be fair to that, this is university level control theory. It's a, it's a system that's not merely underdamped, it's, it's actually, it actually oscillates, so it goes like, oh, I'm going that way. Actually, you wanted you want to wave your thing on. I left it up there. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, well, we'll go like this. I thought, right, it's never going to happen. It's just great. If it goes that way, it goes, bzz, goes that way, it goes, bzz. what could go wrong? Well, it turns out it goes that way. It goes, vroom. And it goes, oh, no, vroom. <laughs> I was sitting there. Zach did this. Set it up on the table. I'm sitting there like pint in hand. Like, and, it goes, and it throws what can only really be described as a complete fit. It goes, <laughs> Zach, was actually, Zach was actually holding it either side like this, um, which <laughs> Zach got a bit cross at me for like. But this is actually a very, very, very key point. I actually remember saying to you quite distinctly at this point, I said, save the code, save the design, save everything at this point. We want a snapshot of this. Because why it didn't work is a really, really, really key thing. So I realised that it was overreacting, so we decided to decrease the power going to the motors. But basically what we found is that either it would overreact, overcorrecting itself, or it would underreact and just fall over anyway. That's when I realised I needed feedback. Yeah, so this is what that is. Now, there's lots of different ways to do it. Actually, on the next slide yet? Have a look. Yes. Yes, excellent. Uh, you need to talk about your robot. Oh, yes, the robot going north. I decided to do a robot that goes north. Now, this is much, much simpler. Because you always, the good way to design this stuff is I wanted something that's much, much simpler to design, I could actually work on. The thing about the robot standing up is it's actually quite complex. You've got all this condensation and movement and sensors, and it's all really quite fast. The robot going north was much, much simpler. Out there, there's several of these like robot chassis, which you've got like two motors on them, blah, 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 blah. I also bought a magnetometer, i.e. a digital compass. Happy days. You get the, the, the digital compass up to the motors, and jobs are good. Un. Which brings us back to how things go wrong. That's some of the maths of it, which is getting a bit complicated, but this, this, this is the P in the P, I, and D. The P is proportional. What you've got to remember is the, where you want to be going, let's assume for argument's sake, that's north. But we happen to be pointing this way, for argument's sake. That difference is the error. So we often deal with what are we going to do with the error? How much are we wrong by? This here, in fact, actually, oh, I could get to use a laser, fantastic. <laughs> this bit here 
actually is just a posh maths way of saying the error at time t, or the error now. So what the p term is, you look at how far you're off, you, you multiply that by a constant, and that's what you feed back in. So, if that's north where we want to be going, we're heading that way, we nudge it back that way. If I was facing that way, we'd nudge it back twice the amount. If it was only a little bit off, we'd nudge it back, say, half the amount. So the more off you are, the more you nudge it back. It's simple, linear, in proportion. Sounds fairly straightforward. And guess what? It almost worked. But there were problems with only using P. Um, we can't take the error from the se sensor into account when deciding what to output. If we only take just, just the P into account, we have problems. For example, if one motor is more powerful than the other, the PID controller wouldn't take this into an account. With the going north robot, if one motor was more powerful than the other, but we were only taking the reading from the sensor into an account, the robot would start going north, but both motors would get the same power because there is no error, causing it to turn slightly. It would then correct it back to north, but the motors would then again get the same power, causing it to turn slightly. So eventually you wouldn't have a going north robot, you'd have a going slightly off north robot. So uh, I'd be really rude to interrupt at that point. It's actually quite an interesting point because the DC motors are never equal. But you actually end up, if that way north, and let's assume my right-hand motor is a little bit more powerful, then it'll start going that way, they're like, whoop, it'll turn back, it'll end up going just enough that way to balance the motors out. So you've got a slight offset from, from where you want to be. Sorry. All right. The other thing to take into account is the rate of change. For example, let's say you've got the self-balancing robot that's already rising back to normal, you don't want its reaction to be as strong as if it's falling rapidly. So you want to take the rate of change into, an, uh, into account. Yes, yeah, actually, I was going to... That's the... I was just sort of hitting the buttons and I want to scrub up on you in a bit. Um, so Jim is just about to talk, to, uh, talk about I and D, which are the um, two things which take these into account. The long-term error and the rate of change. Yeah, actually, I is quite interesting. This is the integral component, which is, we had a long discussion about this because, I mean, no one's going to see this platform, this thing, but I hope it's going to work. Here's the north we want to go, and our robots ended up going, for argument's sake, we're going to assume that the right hand motor is a bit stronger. It'll end up trying to head that direction, where that angle gives us just enough power to balance things out. So it's torn between two things. It's like the bunky between two piles of, of, of carrots. It wants to head north, but if it heads that way, even so at least it's actually in, in balance. Now, we then talked about the error. And someone said, oh, it's the average error. But actually, this is the bit that's a bit weird, which gives a little bit of trouble with. It's not obvious. Rather than taking the average error, you take, you take the sum of all the errors. So, you see this, this T term, you take, so, you take so many samples a second. So you're looking like, let's say, 10 times a second, for argument's sake, right? So you take all these little samples, which are getting bigger. Now you could take the average. What you actually do is take the total. So in your main loop, as we're actually going to be, to be discussing in a bit, these errors start adding up actually quite fast. So on the I part of the PI and B, it's another constant that you multiply by the total of all the errors. So for each of these, we've got a correction, which is the angle, which remains the same. But now we've got an added term, which is the sum of all of, all of these errors, which is starting to build up. That way, over time, this value starts building up and it starts edging back. So it will start heading back to try and lower that down. That provides us with a correction for uh, the long term error in the system, the, the, uh, constant term errors. Could I do D as well, Matt? Yeah. Looking this up on Wikipedia, there most PID controllers don't use D. They just take this, they take the immediate feedback. In fact, 
in most systems, the robot I built, the robot going north, just uses P. And that actually, that's pretty good. It actually works pretty well. Introducing the I would mean it would work better. I didn't get around to introducing I. There's a reason for this. Interference. It turned out when I first built it, and I actually tested it in, in the office where I work. This is like a completely modern office with a classic raised floor, and there's all the power goes under the floor. So the robot's going along. It goes, look, 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 look. I look like, what? Power cable running under the floor. Next outing of the robot was to um, the local pie club at a local school. Strangely enough, well, this, is, this was in the physics lab at that school. Strangely enough, who would have guessed there are some stray magnetic fields in a school physics lab? The robot goes berserk. It just randomly wanders around the floor. Hilarity ensues. To give the students credit, one of them picked up a bar magnet, quite a powerful bar magnet, pointed it the right way, and it was like this. And the robot followed him around, which is an absolutely great demonstration of how good it is, and the P part was actually good enough. Winding back in history, where did all this come from? It was originally used to control ships, to be an autopilot for ships. Because 100 years ago, when all this cropped up, this was, this was a big deal. People were sleeping really had an autopilot in, you were in, the, in, the, in the middle of the Pacific, you set the autopilot, off you go. If you've got this long-term drift, and you're two degrees out for a day at 20 knots, I can't do the maths, but if you do the maths, you're out by a long way. Which is bad, because it means your cargo arrives late, which costs money, people get cross, that's why this was invested in. So the I part finds this constant error and corrects for it. Then onto the D part. So P is the error right now. How far are we out? Nod you back a bit depending on how far we're out. I is how far over all of time have we been out? We'll correct for that. D is a bit weird. D is how far are we out now minus how far were we out last time? What's the difference in how far we've turned out? Now Wikipedia says that very few controllers actually use this. Which tells you something, for starters. However, last weekend, when I was at EMF camp, not my boat, hmm. uh, there was a superb talk on quadricopters, as there was earlier. And the guy was talking about PID controllers in it. Now, the robot going north is great. You can watch it on the floor. It doesn't crash. It doesn't move too fast. It's fine. Balancing robot, much tougher problem. Quadricopters ah, are a nightmare. You end up with an expensive crashing noise and or it hitting people and walls and stuff, and it's not good. The D component, it turns out, is really important for quadricopters. Because if you're spinning around and you start to stop spinning, it keeps track of that. It basically measures inertia in the system, which in things like quadricopters is really quite important. But for the relatively simple robotics, specifically things like pine walls, you probably don't need it that much. But you need to see if we did it for the Stanley Uppy robot. It will. I think quite fun to find out. So we actually get this. So our, co our corrections so far have been P out, which is a proportional one. I out, depending on the, the sum, that's just a pot. I need more lasers. Everything, oh, every talk's better for more lasers. Um, you've got... There's a button. Not on that side, there it is. That's just a posh mathematical way of saying I want the sum from start of time until now of all the errors. D is the t times a particular constant, and the D component is yet another constant times basically the change in the error over time. It is generally viewed, ho de ho, that the P component is the most important, the I the next important, and the D is often not used, but might be important in some cases. All right, so the other thing that we're going to talk to you about is, is these, these constants, um, KP, KI, and KD. Um, these are three constants which you have to define for your PID controller, which determine um, the importance and the relationship between the output 
and each term. So um, if we go, actually we want to go back to the, the if we go back. She's the back button in the blue office. Hey! And back again. Back again. So That's you, good. you can see here <laughs> all, all the different results you get by changing the constants. So eventually you'll find that the perfect constant, um, which stops it from oscillating, um, there's almost an art to working out the correct constants. Um, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Um, in theory, ho de ho, you can work it all out mathematically. In practice, that's rubbish, because if you've got a perfect mathematical model of what's going on, then you're not really modelling what happens in reality. If you look at these, this is, this is one of the classic problems. You've got the, uh, the, the red line is what's known in the trade as over-damping, so it's not going to go too far the other way, but it's, not, it's taking its time to get close to what you actually want. Sorry, this is the blue line is the input, like so you want to turn left or something like that, right? Uh, the, the red line, yeah, it gets there over time. That's just using the KI. Um, actually, this, these are just all the young KI ones, aren't they? The black line is what's called underdamped. So it goes like, if it's, a, if it's both the farm space, to be, to be heading towards the door, and I'm heading this way, it's like, well, hang on, no, the other way. Uh, no. No, no, it slowly builds down. The green line is technically underdamped, but you can see it actually closes down an awful lot, lot quicker. Now, the reason why there's no right in huge quotes answers to this is that it all depends what are you doing. If you're parking up a, sh up a ship in a port, then you want the red line. Because if you sit there and go over, you go smash in, into the um, port boundary, it's not good. If you're actually flying through the air, green's probably a fairly good one. Black's probably a bad one unless you want all your passengers sort of going <laughs> So it all depends on circumstances. What do you mean by best? And that's a very arbitrary decision. The rule of thumb brackets your mileage quite literally may vary, is that you tune P first, then you tune I, then you tune D, and roughly. Do you get knock-on effects, like if you tune I, do then you have to go back to P and tweak that? Or? Yeah, off sometimes. Right. I, think you, I think you just actually have to, have, have, have to play with it, it all depends on the characteristics you want. I know that there is a massive amount of discussion and debate about this on the quadrocopter mailing this, this cropped up an awful lot. Because that, actually, quadrocopter is another cra classic case in point. If you're, if you're coming into land, you want to land smoothly, I'd recommend the red one. <laughs> <laughs> Going for the black one is expensive and <laughs> quite complicated. Actually, quadrocopter is another classic example I got. I took about different modes. There's a stability mode. Which basically means if you take your hands off the controls, it goes And we had a hell of a wind last weekend, and things were going on. And they were doing a really spectacularly good job of balancing in this frankly howling gale. I couldn't believe the job they're making keeping still. That's what they call stability mode, which is like doing it right. They also have something called acro mode, where you tweak all these parameters. Acro stands for acrobatic, which means that if you're not paying attention to your controls, you're going to have a very expensive pile of junk on the ground. It does what it does. Um, acrobatic mode is like, yes, I want to stay at a constant pitch. It'll stay like that, it'll stay like that. Acro mode, it stays at a constant rate of rotation. So if you just take your hands off the controls, it just rotates around in the air, which of course means it does all sorts of weird shapes and eventually ends up crashing. So again, what you mean by optimal depends on what you're actually trying to do. That's why it's an art and not a science. Go on to the summary of the pit. Do which one? Um, that one, next one, this one. Oh yeah. This is like some really hideous mass. I was trying to stick clear of the mass. Um, but this actually, I'm going to point out the, the, the really key bits here. Effectively, any of these systems, this is really horrible. What you've actually got is this bit here, which is um, where you want to be. 
I want to go north, I want to stay in level flight. Uh, what does R stand for? It sounds like something vague. That, that, it doesn't really it's the, This is what I want to be, is the key input. What you've actually got from stuff is what it actually is. So you actually take the difference between that and that's the error. That's the key thing. So you now know what you're on, what the error is. You split that three ways, one of which is the, yeah, okay, take the error, multiply it by a value, that's one output. You take the, take the error, add it to all the previous errors, so you get a huge volume of error equals error plus blah, 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 and multiply that by another constant, and that comes out. You also take this error that you've just got in, subtract it from the last error reading you got, multiply that by a third constant, which is your third output. Add all those three together, Happy days, that's the feedback you put back into whatever it is to, to control it. And there's some sort of fudgy thing that goes on here to actually control your process depending on how you actually feed it. So, for example, in my, in my robot go, goes north, that value coming out adds more power to one side and decreases the power on the other side. That's the basic model behind it. There's vastly hideous quantities of mass on there, which is frankly quite scary. Um, but... Yeah, that just sums it up, really. So here we have um, an example PID controller written in Python. So this is for you to add into your own robotics projects. If you contact one of us, we'll email it to you, um, and you can add this into your projects. You initialize it, you pass it the constants, um, and then you um, run it every so often. Uh, another important thing about the PID controller is uh, your loop time, and um, that's very important, um, and it depends on the actual sensor. If you get noise from the sensor, you might want to choose a different loop time. So that's another important thing to think about when using a, a PID controller. So yeah, if you want to use this in your projects, email one, one of us. Uh, you can email me with that email. Uh, Jim hasn't put his email on. That's quite kind of, no, I keep on switching email addresses. Actually, if you put it through yours and you can forward them to me, if you get that, yeah. that probably works. Uh, and if you also have any questions about robotics or PID controllers, email me. I might pass it on to Jim. Um, there we go. Any questions? Did you standing up robot working? Not yet. That's something I'll work on at home. I'll, uh, I'll keep it updated on Twitter. It is quite a complex one. Actually, it's an interesting point about, about the standing up the robot thing. Is think about the difference between trying to, trying to balance a pencil on the end of your finger, which is basically more or less impossible, and if you've got, say, a broom handle. Like, I think you know the broom handle with the, with the broom at the top, which is actually easier, because you've got all where all the inertia is. Some of the mass behind this ends up being horrible. Uh, what, a lot of the stuff in here, actually, is all about doing that. The actual guts of it is actually in here. So that's the change in time, that's the change in the error. So it's multiplying, you know, you've got like, right, okay, blum, blum, blum. What works out the correction based on where we are, which is like the, the error now times KP, adds the error times blah, 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 computes that, blah, 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 takes a difference, blah, 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 all happy days. Um, You've actually done a, a really neat, neat job there, because the time might not always be the same. So it's putting a lot of effort into readings not being at exactly the same interval. That's why something that gets complicated. I've been working with 100 readings a second, which is probably overkill for the robot goes north, but not overkill for the standy up thing. Mm -hmm. So you then start getting into all sorts of tune this, tune that, tune the other. The major reason we wanted to give this, this presentation is the classification point was the speed test where you've got to go between two points at the other end. Um, if you don't go between the two points, that's probably a fail. Yeah. So this is how you keep your robot going in a straight line. And you can get things like, like gyro sensors and you use this sort of te technology to keep it going. Or you can just have the Moses reasonably easy, evenly balanced. Or you can use remote control, which is slower. Remote control. You can use remote <laughs> control for the straight line test. It's just that it's going to be slower going forward, stop, turn, forward, stop, How turn. How does this work with multiple dimensions? Because obviously 
understand the other area is one dimension, isn't it? And is this, so you'd have one PID controller for X, one PID controller for Y? One Typically, PID. yeah. Again, it depends very much on the application. I right. caught a brief look at what they do with quadricopters, because that is a nightmare. You've got four outputs, one for each of the four motors, and you're tweaking it around and how it all moves. In fact, there's the pitch, yaw, and roll, depending on the power of all the, all the four motors, plus up and down. It is just nightmare maths. Um, the guy who actually gave the talk last weekend did it to, to, to actually understand the maths in his own head. And the results, I have to say, were spectacular. I never did get to quiz him over what he'd actually done. He must have done a whole lot of this sort of stuff at university because it is non-trivial. I'm very impressed by quadricopters. Just seeing them around is spectacular. Especially if you're in a huge, great wind that's actually blowing across. To stabilise yourself in a gusty wind so well is just unbelievable. That's this. I saw one on a windy day and it was sitting at an angle like that to keep still because it comes come back the. Um... That's a lovely point, actually. If you've got like a wind and exactly like that, keeping still, that's actually quite a complex thing to achieve to actually get. Now, what angle does it need to be in the, in the wind? And if you don't provide any control, but because you've got the, the, the four. DC motors, they're never going to be balanced. Unless you get this spot on right, you've got to be absolutely perfect. Or it just goes nip, <coughs> and those rotor blades go around at 10,000 RPM, and the, and, the, and the leading edges of the blades are actually quite sharp, which provides a very strong incentive to get it right. It saves you money the lawn as well. <laughs> One spot on the lawn. <laughs> <One spot. laughs> yeah. Well, it depends how many times you crash it, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> just end up with a big hole and hypo <laughs> batteries which don't like being abused. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. So yeah, yeah um, obviously Python, I mean if you're running this thing hundreds of times a second, Python isn't the ideal language for it. And I wondered whether there are any you know, standard packages because really once you've got a PID controller bit of software, you don't ever look at that, you just feed the K values in, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that the pipe could run the pipe and fast enough. I never believed it could. Mind you, you were the one who did the ultrasonic distance sensors. Yeah, that was fine. I do not believe you could actually you know, send an ultrasonic pulse out or something, catch the echo back, and time it in Python on a pi. I, if it's, if you it, it'll me, surprise you what the pi can do. But the, this is actually a I've been in business for a long time. <laughs> I'm, uh, but on the other hand, Python is always going to be 10 times slower than C. Oh, yeah. So, what I was asking really was, are, are, are there any libraries? Which which probably, I haven't seen, because part of this was actually to write it from scratch. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's great. And I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to degrade oh, what you've done. It's, oh, it's good. Almost but, certainly there are out there. Yeah, um, so it's a bit like this for the Arduino. Yeah, yeah I'm sure there's a whole yeah. load of open source quadricopter libraries. And yes, I, I saw an, a, an Arduino library which was written by a professional, and that seemed to be very good. Uh, he uh, said his job at, at his work was to tune the three K values, and that was all he did at work. That is a lovely example of, of how he'd actually do it literally, professionally. Using a Pi, which is not guaranteed real time, and using Python. Not exactly famous as a real-time language is exactly the point you you were making. Would never work for a, uh, a quadricopter um, because the response times are so critical. Um, an Arduino maybe has a tenth, a hundredth the processing power for Pi, but you've got 100% of that all the time. No one's getting in your way, and that's the key thing. Um, for the for the robot going north, if it just sits there and just sort of goes away for a little bit, for a tenth of a second. No one notices. If you're a quadricopter, you slice someone's finger off. Big difference. Um, it was interesting to talk about the whole quadricopter software, actually, because it runs a whole series of, of, of checks, because if you switch it on, you tend to be next to it. So if you're sitting there and you've got this quadricopter and you're switching it on, you really want to make sure the software's right, because you don't want it to sit there and take off full power on your face. You know, this is actually quite seriously dangerous stuff. So there is, again, very, very, very great differences and degrees here. Um, this stuff is great for learning, but you never fly an aircraft with it. It's just too fast. And it's also, it's too critical. You've got to have that check, 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 check. You've got to check it every 
fiftieth, one hundredth of a second, if you skip half a second with, with robot heading north on the floor, probably no one will actually notice. If you lose control for half a second on a quadricopter, you just trash several hundred quid with a quadricopter. Saying that though, you could offload the real time control stuff to an Arduino or do it seal on the pipe and mm. then have the because I mean obviously you're going to use this and someone's going to be putting the changes where they went to turn or whatever. You could do that on the Raspberry Pi. That would make a lot of sense. Sorry? You'd get 100 litres per second with that class. Oh, yeah, yeah. you would. But the, you, you might get 100 loops a second, but if the Pi goes off to do something else or the SD, yeah, sure. yeah, that, that's, that's the key issue. You wouldn't split it down, yeah. You yeah, wouldn't you're want doing it, it on four axes, and you're doing it for... Yeah, but with, so you're talking about quadcopters, I'm talking about It'd be fine for a robot. It'd be, It'd be absolutely for fine. Robot. Yeah. Quad cops is a completely different kind of thing. It's, it's, it's an interesting area, but you know, the pipe you do surprise so him continuously amazed, but he's not going to keep a quadcopter in the air. Having That's said that, someone is going to get a quadcopter controlled in Python just to prove me wrong. I didn't know that's going to happen. The guy did the lecture earlier, did he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm amazed how stable it was. Yeah. It's, it's, you, th that was the, ho the whole point behind this wasn't to produce a particular quadricopter. Okay. It's actually it's a learning exercise. So I understand the ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. That's where you can take it all apart. And so I'd start off, it's like starting with my robot going north. Just use his P. It's a tiny amount of code. It's like about 10 lines long, if that. It's much smaller than that. It's tiny. And it works miraculously. But you know, can you do a little bit better? Well, it turns out, actually, no, because there's all the magnetic interference and there's <laughs> cables <laughs> under the floor, which vastly, vastly outweigh all the rest of it. Um, which is what? That time. Yeah, okay, is there any more questions? Has anyone ever done experiments with real-time Linux? I don't know if I've ever... No, we ought to, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've, this has all been optimised for... Thank you.